this is a talk about Go, the Go programming language, uh, and specifically about dependency management in Go. So we've come a very long way, and I'm really excited to talk to you about this today, and thank you again so much for coming. So let's get into it. My name is Aaron Schlesinger. I work as a cloud advocate uh, in the Azure product group at Microsoft. So um, I work on Windows 95. It's built with Go, uh, fun fact. Uh, no, I, I actually work almost full time on Go, and uh, most of that is on the project that I'm going to talk to you today about. So a uh, little bit of history about Go itself. Uh, who is familiar with cloud native technologies or Kubernetes or Docker? Raise your hand. OK. So most people. For those who aren't, um, these are technologies that are sort of new on the scene relative to the cloud stuff we all know and love, like VMs and AWS and Azure and Google Cloud. Um, it's basically, it's a new way to deploy your code to the cloud. It's a little bit more reliable and resilient. Um, and almost all of these technologies are built on top of Go, this programming language. And Go is a great choice for these kind of technologies because it's actually built for the cloud. It's got native support for things like multi-core, native support for things like remote procedure calls between two different Go processes, and really good support for distributed systems as well. Um, but there's an emoji on there of horror because all of this stuff has been done without package management in Go. So there's no NPM thing for Go. There's no uh, Maven Central or Artifactory kind of thing for Go. Uh, and all of this stuff has been done kind of using a patchwork of technologies put together to make it so people can share code from one library author to one app developer or from one library author to tons of app developers. So let's look at how this has been done in the past in Go. So Go is about a 10-year-old language, almost 10 years old. Um, so it's gone through a couple different evolutions of dependency management. And we're going to go over those in sort of broad strokes before we get into the latest technology. So the first evolution was called the Go path. So the Go path was basically a, a literal package structure on your machine. So you would have a root folder. And this is sort of similar to an Eclipse workspace. You'd have a root folder. And then you've had sort of a hierarchy of code going all the way down to a single package name. And package names were named based on the URL at which they exist. So if your package was written and you hosted it on GitHub, it would be github.com slash my slash package. And it wouldn't have a version number. So no versioning at this point. And that was great because package authors could federate their packages across anyone who wanted to use it. So they could put their package up on GitHub. And everybody would know that if they were going to use that package, they have a URL that they can go to. And they can find the source code for that package. They can find the documentation for that package. And most importantly, they can contact the author of that package to report bugs or ask questions or what have you. So all of that is great because we've got this federated ecosystem. It's really tightly bound with all of the Git operations we know and love. It's tightly bound with these hosted version control systems we know and love, like GitHub and GitLab and so on. But there's a negative to this, too. And the negative is every application on your machine has to share the same version of code. So that is, if I have a package called github.com slash Aaron slash awesome package, you don't get to choose what version of that package to use. You're always going to just use the tip of the master branch. And moreover, if app one decides that it needs the new tip of the master branch tomorrow, then all the other apps are forced to upgrade to that new tip of master. And as you can imagine, if you're working off the head of master, that can be really volatile. You're not working off a stable release necessary, necessarily. So if app two decides it needs to roll back, all the other apps that need to roll back as well. If app one wants the latest bleeding edge feature, and potentially that feature might have a security exploit in it, all of the other apps, app two, app three, app four, they all now have the exploit as well. So very suboptimal here. And this was sort of the first, the first guess at how to do package management. And it was suboptimal on purpose, because the team that first built Go 
decided that they were not going to tackle this problem. They were going to leave it to the community to decide the best way to tackle this problem. And that sounds a lot crazier than it actually is because there was a second approach taken as well. And this approach was basically vendoring. So who's familiar with vendoring dependencies? Okay. So if you have like a node modules directory for JavaScript in the NPM world, basically this is the same thing as checking in your node modules directory. And has anyone seen that diagram of like the heaviest things in the universe where there's like a black hole and then even heavier than the black hole is your node modules directory? So this is similar to that. You would literally just copy all of the code that your app relies on into this vendor directory inside of your app, inside of your repository, and then you would check that code in. You had no other options, actually. There was no NPM-style repository to pull from. You would literally just git clone the code that you need into this single directory in your repo, and Go, the Go tooling, would know to take all of that code and build it into your application. And you would just lug this code around everywhere. You, all your developers, would do, when they get cloned, they would just get it in their repository. When your CI CD system needed to build the code, it would pull all that code down as well. And some of the bigger Go apps out there would have hundreds of megabytes of this vendored code just sitting around. And they would also have Git trees for each of those vendored repositories in their vendor directory as well. So that adds even more weight. And even on top of that, of course, Almost every GitHub repository that's mature and used widely has things like a readme and maybe a documentation directory and maybe even like image assets and things like that. And all of that would come along for the ride too. So if you are app one and you're relying on my PKG at version 1.2.3, that's great because you can control which version you want to use and it doesn't affect any other applications that you have on your computer, unlike in the GoPath world. But at the same time, my PKG at that version might decide it needs to have a 500 megabyte PNG in its documentation. You don't really need to pull that down for the Go tool or your CI CD system to use, but you have to in the, ver in the vendoring world. So better than the Go path, but still suboptimal because of all this space and the, the bandwidth considerations pulling down from GitHub and also kind of treating GitHub like it's an asset repository, kind of treating GitHub like it's uh, Maven Central or Artifactory or something along those lines. So that is also not quite what we want, but we have solved the big problem of having apps sort of isolated from each other in terms of the dependency versions that they have. Okay, so how can we do better than this? The latest technology and the technology that's going to be everlasting in the Go community is called Go modules. So Go modules, of course, solve the vendor directory problem of just copying code everywhere. So now we have a central place to store our code on our machines and in the cloud as well, which we'll get into. And the code is versioned using semantic versioning. So there are clear guidelines on how to version our code and how to tell as human beings, not just as computers, what a new version of code means. We can tell whether it's a new feature added, if it's a breaking change to our code, to our dependency, if it's a bug fix, and so on and so forth. So we have clear signals just from a version number what's going on with our dependencies. From that information, the underlying Go tooling can provide a lot more support for you to figure out when a new build for a new dependency that you pull down is going to fail or succeed or something else. And then additionally, along with being able to have our dependencies not lugged around everywhere for us, we can get this sort of central cache of dependencies once on our machine. And all of our different applications that we have on our machine can share that, again, like the Go path, but now we get versioning. So we don't have to have app one and app two coordinate on which version they're going to use. So we do get rid of the Go path. We have a new cache on our machine that's strongly versioned with Semver. And we're also able now to get rid of the vendor directory because we have this shared immutable cache centrally located on our machine and we don't have to copy the code all around. Now Go modules has some very interesting technology behind it in the implementation details of this stuff. 
That short link has a massive, massive set of documentation, not written by me, written by people smarter than me. So I would highly encourage you, if you're interested in how to build dependency management systems, or you're interested in diving into contributing to Go modules, or how Go will resolve your modules, that's a great place to start. But all the three of these systems that I mentioned, all the way up through the most current Go modules, everlasting technology that we have in the Go community, use this tool called Go Get. So Go Get is a command that's built into the standard Go tooling. And Go Get still will go up directly to those VCS hosted systems. And that's great because we do get that amazing federation perspective. We do get that amazing ability for any app developer to immediately go figure out where does this code live? How do I submit a bug? How do I view the documentation? And again, most importantly, how do I contact the author of that code and ask them a question or whatever it may be, or maybe even contribute? So that is great. And we want to keep that federation. We want to keep that ability to look up code. But we also have this problem now. This problem has always existed, and it's cropped up. And it's starting to crop up more and more as the ecosystem of Go grows bigger and bigger. And it is that Git. GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and all the other hosted repositories out there, and almost all of the other VCS tools out there, are really well designed to mutate code. That's the whole point of them, right? You have commits, you can overwrite commits, you can do tags, and on GitHub and GitLab, you can even rename repositories, or delete repositories, or even worse, you can change the owner of a repository. So these are just some ways that you can go as a library author and break everybody who relies on your library. The bottom one with that nuclear symbol is the worst one. So let's say that you are a repository author for package A, and I somehow compromise your account, and I take it over. And package A is for an encryption library. And app developer was using it to encrypt credit card numbers, let's say. Well, I now own that code base, so I can send all the credit card numbers to me, unencrypted. And you, as the app developer, assuming I don't break the API, you might have no idea that that happened. You might just upgrade the dependency, put it inside of your vendor directory, or if you're using modules, it would go into your global on your machine cache. Your code would still build, but you have no way to figure out, how do I know? Why is it sending credit card numbers? You might not even know that it's sending credit card numbers at all. And that's a massive problem. I mean, we haven't run into that sort of nefarious case yet. We've run into every one of those above the nuclear symbol so far. So it's kind of a matter of time. And as the community grows and grows and grows, Murphy's Law grows and grows and grows as well, eventually something like this will happen. And in the cases before that, with the fire symbol and the bomb and all the way up, those are cases that really, really disrupt the community. And essentially what happens in, let's take the delete repository case, essentially what happens is we hope that someone had a cache of that repository somewhere on someone's machine or in someone's CI CD system. And if they had that cache, we hope that they're generous enough to take some time and put that code up into their own repository. And then we hope that sort of tribal knowledge allows us to spread this knowledge that now there's a new version of that code somewhere else. And you have to alias to that, or you have to change your imports or something along those lines to get that code back into your code base and build your apps again. So still a big problem. Now at this point in the life cycle of Go in the community, we've solved quite a few problems, as you saw. But we still have this problem to solve. And this is the biggest stumbling block that we've seen so far in the dependency community in Go. And we've spent a lot of time trying to solve this problem up till now. But the Go modules technology has a little part of the spec that defines this REST API. This is a Go-specific REST API. It's not a GitHub API or a GitLab API or any other kind of API. It's specifically an HTTP API that the Go build tool knows how to talk to. And it knows how to talk to it to get dependencies down. So this allows us, now that we have an API specified, to build servers, to serve up code. And the servers don't have to be backed by Git or any other system that allows you to mutate. 
So on GitHub, we can tag and we can delete tags. We can, uh, you can delete commits or force push commits. But with this, we decide how we're gonna build a server to serve up modules, to serve up module metadata, and to serve up lists of module versions. So now that we have this abstraction layer and it's an HTTP, well, we know how to do HTTP things because that's the web and we know the web. So now we can start building these servers. So this would be the most common way to build one of those servers. You would use a CDN, a content delivery network. Anybody not familiar with CDNs? Awesome, okay. So you would push assets up to the CDN that, uh, that build this API. And GoGet can just now automatically talk to the CDN. And whatever is behind the CDN can take care of pulling down code from GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, your internal version control system. That one's important, we'll talk about that. And the CDN can now serve up those assets. And the CDN can make sure that things like those security breaches don't happen. Or if they do, that they're reported. And things like those deletion of repositories are insulated against. So someone can still delete a repository from GitHub, but the CDN will still hold the code. So at least people's builds will not be broken. And same thing with force push. Someone can force push and change a commit, or someone can delete a git tag. And that's okay, it will be deleted from the repository, but at least the CDN will still hold that code. So people's builds will not be broken. And then furthermore, the CDN is really fast, right? It pushes assets out to the edge. So there's an edge location near here, actually. So if you do a go build, you're gonna be downloading code from that edge location, pulling it down to your local disk cache, and your builds are gonna be faster than ever. And even more, you don't have to drag that vendor directory around anymore. But now there's sort of a community problem that comes up. And I also like to call it sort of a sociological problem. How do we organize these CDNs? So we've got this open protocol, and that's awesome. We can build lots of different servers, but then how do we tell the community what are the reliable servers and where do you get them from? Well, we've got options like Maven Central or NPM. I would call those central registries. We've got other options like multiple NPM registries, things like we saw with GitHub registries. We've got options like Artifactory, of course, too or you can install your own artifactory and you can point your tooling to that artifactory, be it Java or, or anything else like that. So why do I say that we don't want a central registry? So who writes JavaScript? Raise your hand. Okay, for those who haven't, and there's quite a few of you, in the JavaScript world, there is a central registry, essentially. So you get this tool called NPM. It's a CLI tool. It stands for Node Package Management. And NPM automatically talks to npmjs.com. It's a centrally hosted system that stores all the JavaScript dependencies under the sun. And the npmjs.com system is hosted and maintained by a central authority. That central authority once was compelled legally to take down an 11 line tiny little JavaScript program called LeftPad. Has anyone heard of the LeftPad fiasco? Okay, no more people, yeah. Okay, so this was a big deal because LeftPad was at the bottom of the dependency graph for massive JavaScript libraries like React, and I believe Angular too. So if you didn't check in that massive node modules directory to your own project, which a lot of people did not, your builds are now broken because that organization, the NPM JavaScript organization, had to take that thing down. And now everything that depended on it or everything that depended on something that depended on it, or everything that depended on something that depended on something that depended on it, and all the way up the graph. So anything that had that as a transitive dependency now did not build. That's a massive problem. And this is why we want federation. This is why we don't want central repositories. And so with technologies like Go Center and the Athens Project and Artifactory, we can get that federation. We can both get that federation and have stable URLs where we know that we can tell folks in the Go community, this is where you can go to get code. But if you don't wanna to go to get code here, you have other options that we can show you how to use. Okay, so Go Center is an example of a hosted central repository where you can get dependencies for Go modules. So I can go, and I will show you how to do this, 
I can go and do a go build, and it will not pull my dependencies from GitHub and GitLab. It will pull my dependencies from Go Center, and it'll be using that HTTP API. But I can also put my own Athens install. I can literally run a server that implements that HTTP API, and it can hold my dependencies in that storage for me. But if it doesn't have one of those dependencies, it can go talk to Ghost Center and get it down. Also, not shown on this diagram, is Artifactory. So I can, instead of doing Athens, if I want a commercially supported solution to do this, I can run my own Artifactory, and same deal. I can have it go talk upstream and get my dependencies down. So this is great because we've got the central discoverability and we've got the federation, which eliminates that risk of having one central repository to sort of rule them all. So we're going to do a demo. We're actually going to show Go Center, Athens, and Go Center plus Athens all together. And that little thing on the left is the logo for a web framework that I wrote an app using. And we're going to show building that app using all three of those technologies. So I've got a little demo set up here. Folks in the back, are you not able to see this? Raise your hand if you can't. OK, we're going to do a couple more of these. How about now? Good. All right. So this is a public repository. The link will be up for this. Anyone can go. As long as you have Go installed, you can do this. And we're going to show how to build a tiny little web app that I wrote with that. Uh, it's called uh, Echo or Gin Framework. So a tiny little app that shows pictures of dogs and cats. We're going to show building that app three different ways. OK. So the first one is using Go Center. For those who are not familiar, Go Center is a JFrog hosted Go module repository. So it looks like there are now over 83,000 versions of different modules that you can get from Go Center. No charge, no work. You just do your Go build, and it gets those things from here. This has a CDN. You get your builds really fast. And they're stored on your machine then in that global per machine immutable cache. So you've got this layer of cache system going on. You've got your local disk. And then you've got Go Center. We're actually going to have another layer of cache shortly in between your local disk and Go Center. All right. So first thing, I am going to point my Go tool chain, my Go build, and my Go run, and all my other Go commands to Go Center using this environment variable called Go proxy. How about this? Can anyone not see this? Awesome. All right, so that's it. I have now used the power of federation, and I have pointed my Go tool chain to Go Center. Next thing is I'm going to delete my local cache because I want to use Go Center. I don't want to skip Go Center and just get everything in the cache. Otherwise, it's not that exciting of a demo. Put in my super secret password, 123ABC. And I'm going to clear the screen so you can see Go run in action. So for those who are not familiar with Go, Go run takes all the source code in my repository. So that is that web server I wrote with that handy dandy little web framework that serves up pictures of dogs and cats. It does two things at once. It builds it and then immediately runs the binary. Kind of convenient. I really love this command. So we're going to do that. And we're going to see some output here. This is Go building my binary. So you can see there's sort of three different types of log messages here. We see finding, we see downloading, and we see extracting. So fairly straightforward. Finding figures out, does Go Center have the module and the version that I need? You can see uh, Jin is the web framework. Jin does things with YAML and does testing and assertions and a bunch of other stuff. So that's the Go modules technology in action, figuring out where are all these modules that I need. Then it starts downloading these little zip files of just the code, no PNGs, no readme.md files, nothing but just the production code, not even test files. And it does these things concurrently. After it finds everything, it starts downloading zip files and extracting zip files all in these different concurrent processes. And again, this is where that sort of cloud-native, built-for-distributed systems thing comes in. But I'm not running a distributed system. This is just my local machine. 
So Go is doing a lot of stuff concurrently, really efficiently as well. So we've got a bunch of stuff doing downloading and extracting. And here on this line is where the binary has been built. I'm going to scroll up there so everyone can see it. This is where the binary has been built. And now we are running the web server. So we are running the web server on port 8080 on localhost. And we've got uh, three paths, the sort of index, the main. We've got pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. So raise your hand for cats if you want to see cats. Wow. How about dogs? OK, we're going we're gonna to start with dogs. The cat people, don't worry. We're going to get to cats later. So let's go check out localhost 8080. And for the dog folks out there, this is just to prove the thing built. So we've got a turtle dog, running dog, cute dog, all the other dogs. You can build this thing yourself, and you can see all the different dogs. OK, so that's demo one. We've built the thing, and that's not that exciting. But the cool thing is we've built it without relying on anybody else on their GitHub repository or anything like that. We've just relied on Go Center, which is the JFrog free hosted thing. OK. So what if we can't or don't want to rely on Go Center? What if we're worried about the left pad incident, but in the Go world, if JFrog is compelled to or accidentally deletes something? right? I trust JFrog. I don't think they'll do that. But again, what if I'm inside of an organization and I want an open source thing that I can run myself and I can sort of insulate myself from the left pad type incident? Well, that's where this open source project called Athens comes in. So I'm a core maintainer on this project. And I love the concept. And I started this project because I want that layer. I want to be able to sort of control my own destiny when it comes to my dependencies for Go. So I'm going, to run a Go, I'm going to run an Athens, and I'm going to point it to Go Center. So Athens will have its own storage, like we saw in that diagram. And when it doesn't have a module that I need, it will go to Go Center, get that module, store it in storage. And then from that point on, it will never go up to Go Center for that module and that version again. And that's where the installation comes in. And Athens will treat all of its stored modules immutable. So you can't delete a module if something goes wrong with Go Center. It will be in Athens storage forever, unless you delete it. So we're going to use Docker. Anyone familiar with Docker? OK. If you're not, it's not necessary. Docker is, for those who aren't, it's very simply put, it's a super, super lightweight VM that I'm going to use here to set up and run Athens with one command. If you know Docker, you'll know that that is all not quite correct. So you can come afterwards and, and berate me if you want. OK, so a little bit of what's going on here. Docker run is I'm going to run Athens. I'm going to set three environment variables. Athens download mode equals sync is saying that if a module does not exist in Athens storage, go up to gocenter.io, grab it, put it into storage, and do all that synchronously before you respond to the go build or the go run command. Download URL is where is it going to do that synchronous download. So I mentioned it's going to do that with Go Center. Go ENV is development, and that means we're going to get awesome logs. And then we're going to expose Athens on port 3000 to localhost. And I created a special Athens tagged for swamp up just for you folks. So you're welcome. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So I'm going to do this in a new tab. Let me shut this down. All right, so we've got Athens running now on port 3000. And again, it's configured to go talk to gocenter.io. Athens has nothing in its cache. So remember, we talked about local disk cache. We talked about the Go Center cache. Now we've got a cache in the middle. That's Athens. It's got nothing in that cache. So it's going to fill it with Go Center, or it's going to fill it from data from Go Center. So next up, we are going to now point our Go tool chain to the local Athens. So that's here. We are then going to go and, again, delete that cache. So now we've got nothing locally, nothing in the Athens Docker container, and only stuff on Go Center. Again, ABC123. And we're going to do that same Go run. Okay, so this is the same deal. 
we're going to try to build. There's going to be none of the dependencies available in my local cache. This time it's going to go talk to Athens, and we'll see what happens in the Athens. So same output. We've got a bunch of finding, and then we're going to go, and it'll start doing a bunch of concurrent downloads and extracts. We're going to go over here, and we're going to see. These are how Athens is responding to those finding requests. So you've got two lines for pretty much every dependency. You've got .info and .mod. So .info and .mod is basically metadata about the modules that we require. So this is metadata about the GIN framework at version 1.4.0, and it goes on and on and on. And then you can see it starts switching to .zip downloads. And these are actual code. These are those compressed archives of actual code that we depend on. You can see down here, now it's done all of those downloads and extracts, and those are the ones that correspond to the .zip. And now we've got our thing running again. So let's go back to localhost 8080. And we saw dogs before, so this is for all you cat folks. So now we've got cats. Pretty straightforward. You can see yourself building a much more complex app than mine, or perhaps this one with better styling. Up to you. So now what we've got is we've got, now we've got code actually on local disk, but we also have code in Athens. So if someone else or CI CD comes along and we're running our Athens inside of our organization, they can now point to the Athens that the organization controls. And that Athens can then fill its cache from Go Center. But we can also do this with Artifactory too. And we'll see how that might work. Okay, and this is kind of how that might work is sort of what I call day two advantages. Okay, so you've installed Athens. You have it configured to talk to Go Center. And by the way, there are other upstreams too besides Go Center in the version control system. I actually prefer Go Center. And so you kind of start realizing some of these advantages pretty quickly. So the first one is who's kind of heard of the works on my machine type of problem? Okay. So that's sort of like, you know, you're a developer, you test the thing out once, it works, and then you ship it. And someone else has a problem, you say, well, it works on my machine, I don't care. Right? And that's been a huge problem with the vendor directory and an even, even bigger problem with the Go path that we saw. But now that we've got these caches, and they're immutable, these caches don't change, they don't have evictions, they don't have TTLs, so maybe we should call them storage or databases. We also have those caches serving up zip files. So no longer do we have a vendor. No longer do we have this sort of non-deterministic builds. We also are downloading builds, are downloading dependencies in zip files. So I took two of the biggest Go repositories out there, Kubernetes and a database called CockroachDB. And if I do a git pull or a git clone, they end up being about 20 to 30 times bigger than what Athens or Go Center or Artifactory will serve up in those zip files. And the zip files are still versioned. It's still version code with those semvers. And these are the ones that still are stored in Athens, Artifactory, Go Center. And they still end up being stored on your local disk too. So once you do that first build, you've got the immutable cache locally, and your builds are lightning fast. And they're actually even faster than if you were building against the vendor directory or against your Go path. So speed ups, more deterministic builds, that's cool. But the, th the second thing is what I call on-prem or enterprise-y features. So all of these things you might be familiar with if you've used Artifactory before. Athens is sort of the open source alternative to that and supports things like private code. So Go Center doesn't have access to your private GitHub repositories, but Athens can do that because you would run it internally behind the firewall. And because you're running this thing behind a firewall, you can audit the public dependencies that you pull down. Athens can kind of act as a bastion host that has, it pokes a hole into, in your firewall. You can have everyone inside of your org talk to Athens, and then Athens can decide what dependencies and what licenses and what security vulnerabilities are you going to allow into your organization. Exclude lists will do that too. And of course, I talked about isolation, where Athens can be the thing that sits between developers in your org and the public internet, where all the dependencies you need are. And those can be accessing GitHub, they can be accessing Go Center, or they can be accessing another upstream. And you, the operator of Athens, gets to decide 
Where are you going to get your dependencies from? And what dependencies are you going to get? So it's really nice to be able to stop dependencies from coming in before they come in, rather than going and doing audits for every developer's machine, figure out, well, do they have something that we don't want in our org? Or do they have something that has a security vulnerability? And if they do, then need to figure out a way to sort of roll that back, get the code out, and sort of rebuild all of your binaries, all of your production systems without that code. And then the next thing that I usually see sort of in week two or three is that we can start taking advantage of these open APIs. And I talked about that uh, the five endpoint API that defines how you can pull down modules. It's just that it's five get requests in a REST API. They serve up metadata, version lists, and the zip files. So because we've got this simple open API, anybody can build one of these servers, and anyone can decide how they're going to manage module code. Artifactory does it. Athens does it. I talked to someone who did a server in Bash. So you can literally write a Go dependency server using Bash if you want. Go Center does it, and there are a couple other hosted ones out there that do it. You can also build layers that are not dependency servers on top of these APIs too. So that would be things like security vulnerability checks, documentation. There are things like format checks and linters. And all of these things can be built on top of those APIs, hosted if you want, or built into systems like Athens and Artifactory. So I mean, we get kind of this ecosystem now. Right, the, the gopher or the thing with the hair and the flower and the sunglasses is the icon for Athens that we have. Don't ask me why. I'll tell you afterwards if you want. Um, so that's Athens. And it kind of sits, I made this, this, uh, I made this diagram sort of as like a forest or an ecosystem of different technologies that all support Go now. We've got this federation now of all these different dependency services that we can take advantage of to build our Go code without having to rely on the patchwork of vendor directories and go paths and things like that. And this is the technology that's going to kind of supercharge development of the cloud native stuff in the future because sharing becomes a lot more easy now. Right? If Kubernetes needs a library that I develop, they don't have to really rely on me to not get push-f anymore. And taking my dependency on is one thing. But taking on my responsibility to not screw it up in my Git history is a massive, massive risk that Kubernetes would not have wanted to take on. But if they can go and run their own Athens, or they can take advantage of Go Center or Artifactory, they reduce that footprint and that risk a huge, huge amount. Because if they need to, they can just take over the dependency without having to take over the GitHub repository, without having to take out the security vulnerability risk, and so on. So that is it. Um, you can always reach me with questions if you want. I would be happy, more than happy, to answer questions about Athens or Go. My DMs are open at that Twitter handle. I would really encourage you to go check out gocenter.io. That's the JFrog hosted one. And we also have documentation on Athens at docs.gomods.io. And if you're looking for sort of like a more, uh, I would say, a commercially supported version of Athens, because Athens is the OSS version, check out Artifactory. You probably are familiar with it because you're here. You may not be familiar that it supports Go modules. So it is the commercial equivalent of Athens in the Go modules system. And then I want to give a quick shout out to uh, this Twitter user, at Franzia, who's my wife. Uh, and she made all the diagrams. She, made, she spiced up the slides a lot. So finally, um, I want to encourage you to fill out session feedbacks. Um, the title of this talk, you can just put Go Modules. My name is Awesome Mick, Awesome Face. Or you can say Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. Um, and then just give me an honest review. I really appreciate it. Uh, the organizers also really appreciate it, too. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Please come talk to me afterwards in the hall. I'd be more than happy to answer questions for you. <laughs>